Okay. All set. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Friedman, the president of the Orient Association. Welcome to our information session about the Suffolk County Department of Health Services water quality survey expansion in Orient Village. Tonight, we have Jason Heim here to explain why Suffolk County Department of Health Services is expanding the survey and to answer your questions. Jason is the principal public health engineer and chief of the Office of Water Resources at Suffolk County Department of Health Services. We ask that everyone please remain muted during the presentation. And if you have questions, please use the chat function. We will be recording the presentation um, to post on our website. So here's Jason. He's gonna start with explaining what, what we're looking at here. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, Barbara. And thank you everyone for attending and the Orient uh, Civic for having me. I uh, really appreciate having this open venue to uh, describe all the work that our staff has been out there doing and um, all of the analytical sampling that's been conducted and then the work that we're uh, planning for the future. So uh, without further ado, um, for those of you that uh, participated in the last session, I want to say back in October, much of the presentation is going to look uh, similar uh, until we get to the end where we talk about the proposed expansion. So uh, if that's the case, I do apologize. Um, okay. So again, we're gonna be going over the background uh, behind the, the PFAS compounds, what they are, where they come from, uh, what are the potential health effects associated with the compounds, uh, the various regulations uh, that we're comparing these to as far as uh, health benchmarks. And uh, we'll discuss a little bit of the work that we've done related to contamination sites and investigations uh, with groundwater work and uh, our private well survey work. And then we'll focus specifically on our Orient private well survey, uh, where we you know, were back in October, uh, what kind of results we've received thus far, and then uh, what our plans are over the next several months. Okay, so what is PFAS? Where does it come from? PFAS is an uh, anthropogenic uh, man-made compound. It's an industrial commercial product. It's associated with essentially those uh, things that repel, grease, stain, uh, stains, water. Uh, they've been used in a number of consumer products, uh, as you see here, textiles, food packaging, nonstick cookware. Uh, however, what's good is that the major U.S. manufacturers uh, have agreed to phase, um, you know, production of these products out. Uh, PFOS and PFOA, as we refer to them, or perfluorooctane sulfonate, PFOS, and perfluorooctanoic acid have been the most extensively studied and produced of these chemicals, and they're both persistent in the environment and in the human body. All right. So I, uh, I love this uh, picture. We talked about it last time. I borrowed this from a, a California presentation. Um, PFOA, uh, mainly used in the manufacturing of uh, polymers, uh, like things like nonstick cook pans you can think of. Uh, also uh, firefighting foams from 1965 to 1975. Uh, and PFOS was used also in firefighting foams, hydraulic fluids, and photolithography. We talked about that was a process where they use light uh, to produce patterns as part of circuit manufacturing. Um, the major consumer products with PFOS are those, you know, repellent uh, treatments that they put on clothes, carpets, uh, paper and packaging materials. Uh, the good thing is that um, just recently, uh, New York state law went into effect that prohibits the sale of food packaging, which has intentionally added PFAS compounds. I don't know about you all, but I've noticed my local uh, takeout, um, you know, containers have changed over the last uh, couple months. But you know, these are examples of where you know you may have seen PFAS. You know, microwave popcorn bags, dental floss, 
nail polish, candy wrappers, food wrappers, uh, you know, that clothing that we talked about, pizza boxes, paints, eye makeup. Um, so all, all these, uh, you know, could have had PFAS compounds associated with them. So why are we concerned about PFAS? Well, they're highly persistent, you know, not only in our, uh, the environment, but also our bodies. Uh, they concentrate in proteins, and then they're cleared a little slower, uh, primarily through our urine. PFOA, um, based on epidemiological studies uh, that our environmental toxicologist, Amy Ucats here at the county, uh, has done a little work, a little research to uh, look this up. But these studies have said that there's an increased uh, risk of kidney cancer, uh, liver immune system toxicity, uh, increases in cholesterol levels, and then suggestions of uh, increased blood pressure, preeclampsia associated with pregnancy. Uh, and then the animal studies confirm that, um, and then it's a liver and immune system. Uh, it's toxic to those, uh, it's toxic to our thyroids, uh, developmental and reproductive effects are possible, uh, and cancer. For PFOS, it's very similar, you know, immune uh, system toxicity, uh, increases in cholesterol, alteration in the way we metabolize, uh, you know, fats, oils, uh, things like that. Uh, Preeclampsia, again, that uh, high blood pressure. Um, and then inconsistent observations of breast, liver, and pancreatic cancer associated with PFOS exposures. Uh, and in the animal studies, the liver and immune system toxicity, thyroid toxicity, again, developmental and reproductive effects, and liver and pancreatic cancer. So how are we exposed to these? You know, we're exposed to PFAS. You know, you can see, again, this number of different products out there. Um, it can be in our drinking water, and that's uh, the primary route of... Um, exposure that we're focused on right now and one that the state health department has advised us is of most concern i know that there's been some questions from the community about you know concerns about showering in the water uh, they have advised us is that it's not a significant source of pfas exposure it's more of ingestion uh, so through eating and drinking uh, but uh, also could be through air. Uh, so that's also a, a lesser route of exposure for these particular compounds. Oh, what do the regulations look like at the federal and state level? Well, going back six, almost seven years ago now, um, and, and a little bit before that, the federal government identified PFAS compounds as a potential concern and before they can set a specific drinking water standard, they need to show that there's occurrence in the public water supply uh, industry nationwide uh, before they set a federal drinking water standard. So they do what's called an unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. And this requires the major public water suppliers out there, you know, the Suffolk County water authorities of the nation uh, and the larger districts to do testing for up to 30 different contaminants. So between 2013 and 2015, they did that monitoring under their list three at the federal government level. And they reported all those results uh, to the federal government. And those are all available um, you know, to the public. We can go online and get that. The minimum reporting levels at the time, unfortunately, were a little bit higher uh, than we're comparing things to now. They were looking at PFAS concentrations uh, only down to 40 parts per trillion and PFOA down to 20 parts per trillion. Most of you know in the community that we're comparing these down to the New York State standard of 10 parts per trillion currently. In this initial data set, uh, we only had seven detections uh, in all of the different public water supply well sources that were monitored. You know, um, and that was at five different well fields and they only found up to 530 parts per trillion. I say only because you know, you'll see some of the other results that we've seen since then uh, in private wells in the county. <clears throat> but there were no detections of PFOA 
Now we have, um, at the time, there were provisional, non-enforceable health advisory levels. This was sort of guidance that they gave to um, the public water suppliers to say, hey, you know, this is where we sort of think maybe these could be at a level of concern. We're not enforcing it. We're not requiring anyone to install treatment at this time. We don't even really know what kind of treatments would be effective for these compounds. But we are fortunate to live in New York State and we have a New York State sanitary code that actually sets specific drinking water standards for unregulated contaminants um, at the federal level, um, or unregulated at the federal level. So the New York State enforceable drinking water standard up until August 26, 2020, was 50,000 parts per trillion. So if we did see an exceedance of that level, we could have required uh, actions be taken. Fortunately, we haven't seen anything anywhere close to that in a public or private water supply well. Just to give you sort of a, a frame of reference, you know, you, we start talking about drinking water regulations and we compare them to things, parts per million, parts per billion, and now we're down at another level, uh, parts per trillion. A part per trillion is sort of equivalent to, if you want to think of it in these terms, one second in 31,500 years. So it's a very, very, very small unit of measurement. So where are we as of this winter? Well, New York's uh, State Department of Environmental Conservation, they adopted this emergency regulation which classified PFOS and PFOA as hazardous substances and that's great because what it does is it allows them to utilize some of their Superfund monies that are in that pot to be able to help protect people from exposure. That's what's allowing them to be able to pay for the uh, bottled water and the POET systems that some of you in the community have uh, seen these offers from New York State uh, after you get an exceedance of these standards. So as I said, in uh, August 26, 2020, uh, New York State and the uh, Drinking Water um, Quality Council, uh, they you know, recommended, and then the state went through the authorization process, the legislation to set specific drinking water standards at 10 parts per trillion each. And one part per trillion is equivalent to 1,000 parts per billion, or, oh, I'm sorry, no, <laughs> one part. Yeah, uh, it is equivalent to 0 0.001 part per billion. Thank you. New York State um, also recently proposed new drinking water standards. They're currently re uh, reviewing the public comments uh, and they are trying to set additional drinking water standards for the thousands of PFAS chemicals that are out there. They're trying to set new drinking water standards for four additional compounds. PFNA, PFHPA, PFHXS, and PFDA. So there's going to be, you know, right now proposed specific drinking water standards that under the proposal wouldn't be effective until for public water supplies until January 1st, 2025. We don't know how the state's going to handle that for private wells. What they did is, you know, soon after they made these maximum contaminant levels effective for public water supplies for PFOS and PFOA, they came up with uh, policies at uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. They said, we're going to apply these essentially to private wells. So I would anticipate something uh, similar uh, coming out of the state, but it's all to be determined. They are also uh, coming up with a combined maximum contaminant level for PFOS, PFOA, and these four additional PFAS compounds. Uh, and they've also proposed something called a notification level for 19 other PFAS compounds. Uh, and that proposal came out in October. We're anticipating that to be finalized, I think, um, by April 1st. And that would be, you know, uh, effective and require monitoring from the public water supply systems. And then, you know, they'd have to be in compliance with these new regs by it looks like January 1st, 2025. Um, the federal government has also come up with a new UCMR or unregulated contaminant monitoring rule list five. 
And out of the 30 compounds, 29 of those are PFAS compounds. So there's been a real focus at the state and federal level on these, uh, what we call emerging contaminants. Uh, and the public water suppliers are currently in the process of going out and trying to sample their public water supply well fields uh, to see if there's occurrence of these other PFAS compounds as well. Um, we've also, through the advances in technology, been able to monitor down to lower detection levels. So now some of you that have received your analytical results in the phase one of the private well survey, you've seen that the contract laboratory uh, that the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation has authorized us to use uh, is getting us down to around two parts per trillion, uh, which is great. And that's consistent with what the public water suppliers are doing. They're getting down to that same level. So what else is spe uh, specifically Suffolk County doing um, with respect to contaminated sites and, and our investigations related to PFAS? Well, we've been routinely coordinating with the state agencies, the Department of Health and the Department of Environmental Conservation over the last uh, six, close to seven years with a focus on PFAS compounds. Um, we've looked at areas of known or suspected PFAS, uh, groundwater contamination. Uh, we've identified you know, a number of sites based on, uh, and, and surveys and groundwater investigations based on uh, public water supply well data. Um, any of our suspicions about maybe sites where PFAS could have been used or released or disposed of. Uh, we also monitor test well data and private well data as part of new um, construction applications with our Office of Wastewater Management. You know, they're coordinating with my office, and uh, we're taking all that into consideration as we propose new private well surveys. And that's actually how uh, we discovered this Orient area as, uh, you know, a potential area of concern. Um, so we've initiated over 50 private well surveys across Suffolk County. Uh, we've collected over 1,500 domestic well samples. 15% uh, of these have been ab above the maximum contaminant levels. And our maximum concentration we just observed recently uh, in Orient, uh, actually, was um, combined PFOS, PFO concentration at 3,350 parts per trillion. So, you know, you can see from the pictures here, we sort of start out with a private supply well, we come out, we collect the sample, and then it goes off to the various laboratories. Uh, this is actually one of our chemists in our public environmental health laboratory, the county, uh, analyzing samples. So groundwater investigations, we've done 14 groundwater investigations at airports, you know, county facilities, and then near those public supply wells I mentioned. We've installed over uh, 200 groundwater wells. Uh, most of these have been profile wells where we actually drill down to depth and then we'll pull the well back, you know, and take samples at various levels through the aquifer to try to get a vertical profile of contamination levels, as well as a horizontal uh, profile, of some of the contamination by the number of profile wells we install in an area. Um, 1,100 samples have been collected from our groundwater profile wells and monitoring wells, 11% of which have been over the maximum contaminant levels. And the maximum concentration that we've seen uh, in a groundwater well uh, was over 15,000 parts per trillion. And that's not representative of what someone's consuming, that's just the groundwater uh, in an area. So based on all of our work, you know, we share this information through routine coordination calls with the state agencies. And you know, many of them have uh, become, or they were already, Superfund sites. And uh, several examples are listed here. So uh, down to uh, your community in Orient. Uh, we started this private well survey, you know, following receipt of various, you know, we've got some, a few non-community public water supply systems in this area. Uh, private well data was coming into us uh, from homeowners uh, and then through our Office of Wastewater Management where construction uh, projects were ongoing and they were acquired as part of that permit application process to collect samples for a number of parameters, including PFAS. 
Uh, so, and also test wells, if there was a subdivision going in. We sort of looked at all the data that we had uh, received and five of those wells that we had looked at were above the maximum contaminant levels. And that was enough to pique our interest. And we proposed a, a private well survey to the state agencies. And uh, at the time we were looking, they authorized us to do 67 properties in the original survey one area, or we call phase one. Um, and we were able to allow uh, sampling of these private wells free of charge. Uh, so the county laboratory and our county resources, our public health sanitarians are coming out and offering uh, sample collection free of charge. And then the state agencies are offering that PFAS analysis uh, free through their contract laboratory. And as part of our outreach efforts, what we, is, what we do is we um, uh, go and mail out, we try to find the last known, um, like where the last person that paid the taxes, we try to identify that address and we're gonna mail notices out to the last known uh, owner. And then we're also gonna do, uh, go door to door. So if there's a landlord tenant situation, you know, both the landlord and the tenant would be notified. Or, uh, you know, if the homeowner changed hands, we're actually going out and doing door knocks uh, to the homes themselves. And we did our first round of outreach to the community in October of last year. Um, there were a few people that had not yet responded, uh, so we decided to go back out last month and try to encourage those homeowners. Maybe they didn't get that original notice or notices that we sent out. Uh, we did that just last month. Um, and as I said, we're doing a comprehensive suite of several different parameters, including volatile organic compounds, semi-volatile organic compounds, pesticides, inorganics like metals and nitrates, uh, and bacteria at our Suffolk County Public Environment Health Lab here in Hopog, and then the PFAS samples, the polyfluoro alkyl substance samples are being analyzed by the DEC's contract lab. So this was our phase one area of the private well survey, generally south of Main Road. I know the Candy Man is over in this area. I think this is the fire department. Uh, and we went down um, the, the western boundary towards Rackets, uh, Harbor River Road, and then east to Tabor. And then uh, the southern boundary was essentially Skipper's Lane uh, here for phase one. So that was in August. That was part of our August proposal to the state. So as of uh, Monday of this week, when uh, we put this slide together, uh, the number of potential private wells in the survey area was uh, 64 properties uh, served by 65 private wells. Uh, this was reduced maybe because a couple of lots weren't developed or maybe there was some overlap with some of the homes that had previously been tested. Um, we had sampled 50 of the properties. Uh, there were 15 uh, residents that either didn't respond or they were pending sampling um still or maybe they were just vacant you know maybe in the middle of a home transfer or you know they were undergoing construction and so they weren't available to be sampled uh, out of the 50 wells that were sampled um as of monday we had 33 of the 50 uh exceeded the pfos and or the pfoa maximum contaminant levels here in new york state and the highest concentration that we saw was our highest uh, private well, uh, private domestic well sample of 3,350 parts per trillion combined PFOS, PFOA. And as many of you are already aware, uh, when we get these maximum contaminant level exceedances, we reach out to you, we notify you of the result, um, and then we notify the state agencies and then they or their contractor are reaching out to you to offer you an alternative water source. And initially that may include bottled water. And then because public water isn't you know, uh, available currently in the community, they're uh, offering a, what's called a POET system. And that's a point of entry treatment. It's essentially granular activated carbon. And that's the uh, best available treatment technology uh, that's been identified by New York State Department of Health for these compounds. And it's the same 
um, treatment technology the major public water suppliers are using. Uh, out of the 50, we also had an additional 13 that had detections of PFOS or PFOA uh, below the maximum contaminant level. Um, at this point in time, there's only one of the properties that had uh, no detection of PFOS or PFOA. Where was that? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we're uh, not able to share uh, specific residence results. And I think that we were using the chat for the uh, any comments or questions, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we like to keep your uh, results uh, private and confidential to you, uh, but we do share them with the state agencies to help you know, provide mitigation measures. So based upon uh, the results that we had received, uh, we proposed a private well survey expansion. Uh, and as you know, that's underway. Uh, we just uh, finished up the door-to-door -door outreach Monday of this week. Uh, but we were out there also, uh, I think Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe last week. And uh, we sent out those mailings sometime, I think, uh, middle of last week. So hopefully everyone's uh, received their notice by now. And we also, uh, because of the incidents of uh, PFAS in this uh, private well survey in the phase one area, we also proposed and the state uh, Department of Environmental uh, Conservation agreed to support the PFAS testing of a, for a groundwater investigation. And we're gonna initiate that later this month. You know, we'll be calling in utility markouts uh, in, the private, in the public right away. And we'll be uh, drilling groundwater profile wells. And we'll be sampling those, you know, weather dependent, uh, you know, we, we should be able to install those later in February and uh, hopefully get out there and sample those maybe in March, April. And that's going to be able to try to help us determine, uh, you know, the breadth and scope, uh, or at least, uh, you know, try to in this community kind of see potentially where it's coming from, you know, maybe where we need to potentially expand the private well survey further. So this is our uh, current private well survey area, including our phase one area up here. You know, we had Tabor over to uh, you know, skippers uh, south of Main Road. We expanded to include a few homes uh, up here on north of Main Road, but the majority of our expanded private well assessment area is south of Skippers Lane down to about King Street. Okay. And I think that's uh, pretty much my last slide. Oh, no, I don't. Um, I think this is my last slide. Correct. So what can you expect? We're going to, um, anybody in the survey area, and I'll go back and I'll leave that map up in a minute. Uh, you should have been notified already. If you haven't been, we ask that you reach out to our my office, the Office of Water Resources at 631-852-5810. And you can let them know that you believe that you're in the private well survey. We'll confirm that. And then, our public health sanitarians are going to set up an appointment with you. You know, an adult has to be home. <clears throat> we really want to try to get within the home and collect a sample from the point of use, somewhere where you're actually utilizing the water, either a kitchen tap or bathroom tap. If you do have treatment systems on your home, especially if they're, um, you know, like a, a granular activated carbon based or an anion exchange or reverse osmosis that may impact the concentrations of PFAS compounds, we're going to be collecting samples pre and post filtration to let you know what is in the raw water, as well as you know, what you are potentially exposed to in that uh, tap at the time of sampling. Uh, we'll reach out to you with your results. We'll give those to you verbally over the phone if there's an exceedance, uh, even if it's one of the other parameters. I know we have, um, a few nitrate exceedances, I think uh, iron and manganese exceedances in the community. So I'm sure you've heard uh, from our, one of our public health sanitarians, they reach out to you and they'll give you guidance on measures that you can take or you know, put specific populations, sensitive populations that may be concerned uh, about some of the other contaminants that may be uh, exceeding a maximum contaminant level. 
And then we'll provide you all of the results in a letter as soon as we receive all of the analytical data uh, from both laboratories. And as I said before, uh, if you get an exceedance of one of the PFOS or PFOA uh, maximum contaminant levels, uh, the state's been providing, and I believe they're going to continue to provide alternative water sources. So at this point, I'll uh, bring the map back up and I'll turn it over uh, to you, either Barbara or uh, Tony. Jason, can you see the chat? I can see the chat and I see Gwyn here for Legislator Krupski. Thank you. Uh, Glynis, is there any way to expand the survey area east to Platte Road? So we're currently utilizing the uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's uh, PFAS analytical capability. We have to put together a proposal based on all the analytical data and what we know about groundwater flow in the area. And we have to justify um, you know, pretty much all the properties that we're proposing and why we think that they should be tested. Um, based on all available information at this time, uh, this is what the state uh, has been able to support. If additional data becomes available, you know, we're gonna review that discuss it with DEC and DOH and, and you know, potentially propose an expansion of this work. Uh, Gordy, my property is just above, so it won't be included in the testing. In your opinion, would it be prudent for my family to start using bio water now and or initiate a commercial analysis of my well water? Um, yeah, Gordy, that's really a decision uh, for you and your family on whether you want, you know, you're outside the private well survey area. You know, we're offering this testing free of charge. Uh, there are contract laboratories out there that can do this testing uh, for you. My understanding is that the testing can range anywhere from $350 up, uh, depending on if you have them collect the sample or if you collect the sample. Uh, and then if you do any quality assurance, quality control samples along with that, um, you know, we're doing that right now. Uh, we're collecting, you know, duplicates. Uh, we're trying to verify that there's not any contamination picked up uh, during the sampling event, you know, maybe in the air as opposed to what's in the water. Uh, also, maybe something that could be on our clothes, well, clothes while we're collecting the sample or some of the other equipment that we use in the field or in transit to the laboratory. So we do uh, various quality assurance, quality control samples, which adds additional cost. Um, as far as using bottled water now in the interim, um, you know, th th that's again, a, a personal decision on, you know, for you and your family, you know, if you have specific concerns uh, or uh, health related concerns, we can provide uh, you know, a number for state health department that you can reach out to them and they can provide, you know, additional health related information. Um, but that's really your decision. So let me add something here that um, currently, if you ask uh, Suffolk County Department of Health Services to do uh, a, a well test for you, it does not include um, PFAS, but um, Jason assures me that by April, <laughs> Yeah, um, you can get, uh, you can sign up for them to do a water test for you for $100. The standard $100 test will include at least PFOS and PFOA, I guess, not, not necessarily other PFAS compounds, right? Yeah, thanks, Barbara, for bringing that up. I just got an update from our public environmental health laboratory. We did, we purchased this very expensive analytical equipment. Uh, we are working towards developing the capability. Uh, you know, we hired a chemist and um, they are working towards it. They submitted their application to get approval from New York State uh, Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. And uh, we have to do, I think, one more proficiency sample. And, you know, hopefully if all goes well, uh, we should be up and running in April, probably initially for a limited number of samples per week. Um, you know, we hope to be able to roll that out to private well requests uh, soon. Uh, 
after we get that capability. Uh, but you know, that's some decision that we're going to be working on uh, with our administration and look at what our laboratory's capability is. You know, I don't know if they're going to be able to analyze, you know, a large number of samples right off the bat. So we may have to roll that out over a period of time. But our target date is still April 1st for in-house capability. I see on the chat, a couple of people are asking about the school. Uh, I'm, I'll work my way down if that's okay, unless you want. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Sebastian, uh, can this process be a path to SCWA, creating a shared water infrastructure and mandating that houses connect to it? Um, as far as I know, uh, when the water authority does a water main extension, there is no requirement from the water authority to connect to the public water. Um, the only requirement I'm aware of is if you do home construction and you have um, you know, a public water main within a certain distance to the property, you'd be required under that application process to connect. Um, and I, I don't I don't know what the water authority's plans are at this point in time, whether they're you know looking at expanding into this. It's certainly one of the areas that we have prioritized uh, for you know someone to evaluate for a potential public water extension uh, project just due to the uh, contamination that's been detected. Do you have a gradient map of the concentrations? So, you know, as I said, we don't share. Uh, the specific uh, analytical results specific to a home. Um, but I can say in general, uh, out of the maximum contaminant level exceedances that we've seen, I'd say the majority are generally just over the drinking water standard in the teens uh, for PFOS and PFOA. I'm surprised that the Oyster Pond School is not in the phase two. Uh, no, so Oyster Pond School is actually, uh, that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, um, Linton. Uh, we actually regulate them as a non-community public water supply system. So we're out there, we're inspecting their public water supply system every year. And as part of that process, we're collecting samples. Uh, we've you know, been able to leverage resources to do a limited amount of testing uh, of the public water supply. And we've tested this uh, oyster ponds, I think a couple times at least, and they've been down below the drinking water standards. Although I think there has been low level detections around the minimum reporting level, if I recall correctly, in that two, three, four uh, part per trillion range. Don't quote me on those specific concentrations, but it's, uh, that's my rec to the best of my recollection, that's what they were. Okay, uh, Adam. When was the last time Oyster Ponds tested in? Was it a full battery? Yes, so we do a full comprehensive test every year uh, at Oyster Pond School. It's, it's one of the several non-community water supply systems in this area, along with the Yacht Club. Um, and then I know that there's a restaurant and your post uh, postal office is also regulated. Is there another one I'm missing? Maybe the country store? I think those those are the uh, regulated non-community public water supply systems in this area. Um, and uh, we can release the public water supply system uh, results uh, specifically. So any anyone that's interested in those results, or you know, Barbara, if that's something that you want to submit a Freedom of Information request, uh, we could certainly share those, and you could share those with the community. I, I think. <laughs> I think we already um, put those on our website, the, the school um, results. I th okay. think we published those on our website. I apologize. I don't have those readily available. Uh, the next one's from Simon. Uh, last meeting, we talked about the oyster farm off the end of Skipper's Lane. Any progress there? Thank you for reminding me. Yes, we have been discussing that with uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and uh, Department of Health. Uh, we presented them obviously with our private well survey findings. Uh, they've indicated that the PFAS is not expected at levels of concern in oysters. And uh, based on the current information, there's no immediate action necessary at this time. Uh, but I wanna let you know that we're continuing to share all of our, uh, the community's concerns with the DEC and DOH. 
uh, if anything new comes up, you know, um, that changes that uh, position, um, you know, obviously we're going to be continuing to discuss it. So thank you for reminding me. All right, Tony shared the Oyster Pond School results. Thank you, Tony. Can you explain what a non-community water supply system is? And does that mean the school is not on a well or is it treated by a CWA? So Suffolk County Water Authority, um, the only place they serve um, uh, public water in this vicinity is to the Browns Hills community up on the north side of Main Road further west. Uh, they operate a small um, discrete section of a public water supply in that community alone. Uh, no, these non-community public water supply systems, what that is, and I apologize, that's a, that's a New York state and federal regulation. And what it means is that there's essentially a certain number of the population that can be exposed to the water and over a certain number of days of the year. And that qualifies them to be specifically regulated um, by our office uh, under our sanitary code and the state sanitary code and some of the federal regulations. So we require them to be monitored um, depending on what type of system, whether, you know, what we call a non-transient, meaning it's the same people all the time at the school, think of it's all the same students and teachers all the time. You know, they're going to be uh, regulated at a higher level than, let's say, a business which has a public bathroom. Um, and then it's maybe different people all the time uh, in and out of that bathroom. Uh, so we're in all of these non-community water supply systems, just like we are the water authority uh, every year. And we're doing our own comprehensive suite of testing and we're requiring them to monitor on their own uh, under the regulations. Basically, um, I, I just wanna add, it's, it's kind of a misnomer. A, a non-community well is a public well. So what my, one might call a community well is actually a non-community well. So I think that's uh, part of the confusion there. All right. So the school and those other uh, businesses and locations I mentioned, um, they all have on-site wells and we regulate them. Different from your private home, you know, which is sort of, you know, often, you know, you're on your own. You don't have to get our permission to put treatment on, um, you know, these public water supply systems. They have to, you know, submit a sketch or plans put treatment on and we require them to be tested as where yours is voluntary and you can go out and do that on your own or, you know, take advantage of, uh, you know, our private well testing program or, you know, if you're part of a survey, uh, our free testing. That's everything I have in the chat right now, but I see Laura Lee, maybe she's having trouble using the chat. Uh, she has her hand raised. Uh, yes, because it was hard to type my question. Thank you, Jason. Sure. Um, the okay. The question is probably uh, more for uh, Barbara. However, to start, Jason, it's my understanding that based on the conversation, Suffolk County has sent some people the results of the testing. You just that's, can't that's tell her. us who they are. Yeah, we don't share the specific I name. Yeah, I understand that, numbers. but. You have sent some people the results and possibly some of them have been high. Okay, my question comes to uh, Barbara. I think at the, the first meeting that we had, it, I think I heard that some people were also going to do uh, another test, like a private test, secondary, to see if it matches, sorry, Jason, what the county came up with in their test. Do you know if anybody has done that at this time? I think what we did have one person do that and that it it was the same. Okay. It, there's, there's no reason to doubt what the what the DEC is coming up with. Um well but, the only yeah. the only I'm just thinking of old time orient where we know that public water uh it, they wanted to put the Suffolk County Water Authority wanted to give us public water and, you know, we didn't, we know how that would affect development and it was blocked. 
So, and I'm not saying anything about you, Jason, personally or anything else, but you know, if, if my well was tested, I probably would back it up with another test just to make sure, <laughs> you know, especially in these times, you know, that, uh, but I'm just saying, so somebody had, you know, of one person that at least double checked the test and it was the same. Yeah, that, that, yes. okay. that, that's, that's fine, Laura Lee. I mean, um, you know, we definitely I'm, encourage everybody to get their well sampled at least annually. And, um, you know, if somebody wants to go out and use a contract laboratory, you're free to contact our office. We can give you a couple of names and numbers, uh, you know, for local laboratories that may be able to help you. And, um, you know, the, the I would expect, a, you know, a little bit of variability in the results. I mean, again, mm -hmm. it's different dates that you're sampling. So groundwater quality can change over time. Um, so I wouldn't expect it to be the same exact part per trillion level, but it should be in the ballpark. And that's why that there's this uh, very uh, technical uh, analytical method that our laboratory is working towards. And we have to go through the same approval process that the state DEC's contract laboratory went through to try to get approval for that. They want to make sure that if they send you a sample and they actually do this to check on the labs that are approved uh, every on a cycle, I can't remember if it's every year, every three years, they're going to send you a sample and they're going to say, all right, tell us what's in it. And you have to be within a certain range of what they know was in that sample that they sent them. Right. I'm really just playing devil's advocate here, to be honest with you, just to see, you know, uh, you know, just, you know, leveling the playing field, making sure everything, you know, everybody, everything's kind of working correctly in a fair manner. And, you know, because I know, you know, you can get medical tests and false positives, false negatives, you know, all kinds of things happen. So, I mean, I'm basically definitely concerned about that our quality of water, you know, oh, Laura, like, it needs to be. They, they they they're offering um, you know bottled water and they're offering free uh, filtration systems. They're not telling us, okay, that's it. You have to connect to Suffolk County Water Authority. So I think I think um, we we don't need need to be too worried about um, okay. cons conspiracy theories. Um, yes. At this point, I, I, I'm not a fan of those either, but I'm, just saying, <laughs> I'm playing devil's advocate just to say, you know, okay. you know, okay. whatever. But thank you for letting me ask the question. Okay. Sebastian had a question in chat. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, I will say that uh, this is something that we should get into too, Barbara. Is if you don't currently have a treatment system on your well, you will be offered a point of entry treatment system from New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. If they install the POET system, they've been continuing to monitor those. However, if you have your own treatment system and the state determines that it is effective at removing the PFOS and PFOA, they haven't been providing, you know, offers for, uh, additional testing or um, the carbon change outs at this time. So that's something that you need to be aware of. If you have an existing filtration system and if, it, if it's effective or you voluntarily install that on your own, be aware that it, it won't, at, at least right now, the way it's been going, the state's not been providing the analytical support um, in the future for you know continued monitoring or carbon change outs uh for your own system sort of that's a that's something that you have to maintain on your own actually one person who did did have a very high con concentrations had a, a reverse osmosis filter that was filtering out the pfas but he was also offered a poet system good so Sebastian, uh, to the extent that non-community wells remain available, Yacht Club, Country Store, can we infer that they are under le the levels of concern? Would there be a public notice if water were unsafe? And I hope I got the non part right. 
So yes, non-community water supply systems, if they have detections above a maximum containment level, they're gonna be required to do public notification. And I think this came up, Barbara, we had talked about that previously. There was one of the non-communities in the area. They actually did have uh, detections. I think it was at the post office and the uh, restaurant. There were detections that were up over the PFAS standard and they'd be required to do uh, postings. Uh, I, I think that answers the question. So the, then you would be notified. It would be in uh, an area that you could be exposed to the water. So let's say they have a public bathroom, um, you know, it would be in the bathroom. Uh, for any of the employees, it would be in the back wherever their, you know, taps are located. If they made coffee or something in the back. So if we are all, and that would be the same for any contaminant. Let's say we saw elevated, you know, bacteria or nitrates or iron manganese, you know, they would be the same thing if, if no treatment was provided. If we are all essentially putting straws in a common aquifer, why are the results all over the place house to house? So that, that's a good question. It may be something more for our hydrogeologists. Uh, they may be able to speak to the fate and transport of PFAS compounds better than I could. Um, but depending on where and how, or the number of locations where these uh, PFAS compounds were released, they're going to sort of uh, spread out in the aquifer, in, in the groundwater, and they could go, you know, down vertically in the aquifer. But then as we get down towards surface water bodies, maybe they come back up in uh, elevation um, below um, the land surface. And then they're going to spread out horizontally. Uh, typically over time uh, and with distance as they move through the aquifer. So that's why the sort of the results are, you know, all over the place. Also your private wells, you know, we caution people to try to interpret that data um, to try to identify, you know, use that alone to try to identify the source or sources because those are, you know, sometimes we don't really know the depths of those wells, we don't know how hard they're pumping. Um, you know, we don't know where they're, uh, you know, screened uh, with respect to maybe local potential sources of PFAS. You know, we talked about some of the consumer products and the various, you know, coatings that may be on our clothes, on uh, products around the home. You know, those could be released down into, let's say, an onsite septic system potentially. Um, so. You know, we caution people to, you know, not use private wells alone. That's why we, you know, propose as soon as we confirm, uh, you know, groundwater contamination in the private wells, we want to do a, a groundwater investigation of these profile wells to learn more about, you know, what's going on in the aquifer. I, I hope that helped answer that question, Adam. Thank you for the question. Uh, so is there no more questions. I think we can adjourn. Um, any more questions? Have we covered everything in chat? What are the acceptable levels of MTBE in water? Um, the maximum contaminant level for MTBE was a gasoline additive that was banned in around 2000 in the state. Uh, that's 10 parts per billion. And that was, I think, before PFOS and PFOA, the last compound to be specifically regulated by New York State. Um, so that would be 10 parts per billion. I uh, also want to make uh, you know the community where you know we're also seeing some low level uh, pesticide detections in the area sort of as expected. Some of you that have had your wells tested in the past, you know you may be familiar with this. you know we're seeing you know low levels below drinking water standards for things like uh, the metolachlor uh, compounds or related to allochlor. Uh, imidacloprid and carbamazepine. So some of you may see uh, some of those uh, detections in your results. Are there hypotheses about probable sources in our area uh, from Mimi? Um, you know, we're, we don't know the source or sources at this time. I mean, I think that's the reason why we're doing a groundwater investigation, you know, and we're going to couple that with the private well data, but we can't use the private well data alone. Um, we, we just, we don't know at this point in time, you know, we went through some of the potential PFAS sources, 
you know, there's been areas in the county where, you know, we said, all right, you know, we know that there was, you know, fire training happening here. Um, we've got other areas that were landfills and consumer products were disposed of them. Uh, and you can, you know, start to try to draw conclusions. Uh, but there's been other areas of the county, you know, we just, we, we think it's one thing. And then, you know, we, you know, we do a groundwater investigation and we just can't pinpoint the source. And we, we have other hypotheses that we discuss with DEC DOH. But at this point in time, uh, you know, no, no known sources. We're going to be looking into that and working with the state agencies. Adam has not sure if this was covered. Are you seeing similar issues in East Marion? Uh, I don't, I can't think of a private well survey in East Marion that has PFAS in it right now. Um, I can quick look at my table to see if East Marion comes up, but I don't believe so. Now, I don't have anything in East Marion right now. Okay, uh, very informative. Thank you, Sebastian. Laura Lee, thank you. Appreciate your attendance, Mimi. Uh, probable. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, 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 at this point in time. That's what we're, uh, that's what I can say at this point in time. Um, Adam, thank you. Sebastian, yeah, I worry about conspiracy theories all the time. I assume SCWA wants in. <laughs> They've got, you know, based on a number of private wealth surveys that we've done. Um, you know, they're expanding their uh, distribution system service area, Suffolk County Water Authority and other water suppliers are trying to expand their service territories to try to offer uh, public water to the community uh, as a as a long term solution for these contaminants. And, you know, who knows, you know, what's coming down the pipe with these regulations and the next unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. Heather, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, EW Web, and thank you. I'll pass along that to uh, DC DOH. Thank you. And okay, Greg, I think I think we're we're just getting our um, kudos now from the from the audience. <laughs> so maybe we can we can wrap it up. Thank you, Jason, um, uh, for doing this, and good luck getting. Uh, uh, Good turnout for the second second phase. Um, Great, and I appreciate it. I mean, the, the outreach that you're helping us with through these venues has really been helpful. The response rate's been phenomenal. Please encourage all your neighbors uh, to try to get their well tested and uh, reach out to us, 631-852-5810. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, 1-800, okay. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care, be well.